Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. I've got another uh, great interview for you. I talked to David Dillon, who is a cartoonist, YouTube creator, and former activist. And we talked about a variety of topics, uh, including cartooning, punk, and heavy metal music, and uh, the culture around that, and as well as NGOs in more exploited countries. I encourage you to check out David's cartoons over on Te Geek Life on Facebook. He does a good commentary and uh, is very funny. The link for that and where you can follow David on Twitter and Mastodon will be in the show notes or in the video description. Before we head into the interview, I have to say thank you to all my patrons and a thank you to new patron Sarah Cartwright. Patrons make it possible for me to do this show and at the moment, uh, the money I get from Patreon is going towards paying for all the services that I use to help produce the show. If you want to contribute to this production, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Uh, support levels start at a dollar a month or a dollar fifty for Canadians. Right now, uh, my family is dealing with some expensive lawyer fees, so anything that comes in from Patreon also helps with that. If you can't support me with money, then please hit the like button or uh, go and write a review and give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or on Podchaser. Uh, thank you so much to Shoei Dragon for leaving a rating and a review on both iTunes and Podchaser. I need, I always need more ratings and reviews, so everybody make sure to uh, check out those links in the show notes. You should also subscribe on YouTube or on the podcast app of your choice so that you get new episodes as soon as they come out. Feel free to contact me by messaging on social media, leaving a comment on YouTube, using the contact form on my website, skepticalleftist.com, or by emailing me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. That's everything, and I think uh, on to the interview. All right, hi and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by David Dillon. Um, thanks for joining me. <laughs> Glad to be here. So uh, I guess a good place to always start is a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Who am I? Um, well, I'm an uh, old-time activist, not very... <laughs> Not a lot out on the streets anymore these days, mainly because of a bad back and I moved to some very rural area. So, you know, um, I'm originally from the Caribbean. Okay. And I, uh, I was raised by a very uh, aware, very proud black man. My okay. family is black. I'm, I'm the palest one in the family. Um, so... We had to move to the Netherlands at some point, so now I live in I live in the Netherlands. So you, you uh, used to live in Amsterdam. Briefly, was a part of the squatter scene there, but mm, not my kind of scene. I mean, made a lot of good friends, but it's not really my thing. Okay. Uh, became an activist at age eleven. Started joining protests. Uh, before that, my mom took me, so you know, my mom was an old punk. I'm an old punk. Nice. Uh, we lived in uh, in a in a lesbian commune. We lived in a uh, shanty town in the Caribbean. We've lived in well, you know, everywhere. <laughs> but I was mainly mainly raised around the queer community in uh, in uh, the Caribbean and in Amsterdam. So one of my main things is that everything that everybody is going on about, like you know, e scary trans people. I'm like. What? <laughs> You're the scary <laughs> one, mate. <laughs> yeah. Trans people were my babysitters. I mean, come on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, um, so in, in, in that sense, I've never really felt like an activist or like someone who's doing anything special. I was just living the life that I was grown up. And, and to me, the people who don't get involved with our communities and don't get involved with issues are the, are the strange ones. Right. Yeah. That and, makes sense. <laughs> and 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 these days I um, I quit my high flying career. I've gone back a bit to basics, took a job that I actually enjoy, uh, with a bit of time off to do my side projects like uh, educate people on history on you on YouTube. My all twenty five of my subscribers <laughs> and uh, and draw draw cartoons and be a pain to the right wing on the internet. <laughs> 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. So, uh, how did you get into drawing cartoons? Um, I'm dyslexic. So, okay. as a child, uh, it was easier for me to express myself with drawings than it was with writing. Ah, very so. cool. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, to geek life, <laughs> how long have you been doing that co comic? I think I started somewhere in 2011. But I, I took a lot of breaks because at that time I still had this this suit and tie kind of career, you know, showing PowerPoint slides to people in the board of directors, that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. Um, I think that it's about six years now that I try to do it really regularly. Very cool. What what got you started in this particular like uh, style and theme of comics? Uh, the style and theme. Um, well, like I said before we started recording, I I think I got the idea when Iliad quit uh, user friendly. I felt like there was something there that was I really enjoyed that one. Uh, I thought, well, you know, if no one else is making one, I'll make one. But of course, I'm, I it, it became my own, and I decided fairly early on that it doesn't always have to be a joke. Sometimes it's just an observation about life. Right. It doesn't always have to be funny. Um, because when, you, when you're always trying to make a joke about something, then there's always the risk that you become really mean to people. True. And some people deserve it, and so some people don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. so uh, and uh, it became a sort of a vessel for me to basically put my thoughts on paper or on the screen and I also decided fairly early on that I wasn't going to mainly criticize the right or mainly mm. criticize the opposition. Because as a satirist, because it is satire, I feel my job is to educate, but it's not my job to educate the enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the cartoons are basically a little little pokes at our side. Right, and, yeah. And the broader areas around that, you know, tankies, come on, what are you folks doing? Come on, <laughs> you know, or, or you know, what we hear called the the, the uh, Grachtengordel links, or uh, the Grachtengordel is in Amsterdam, is like the canals where all the rich people live. Okay. And then we have a, a political party that's Green Links or Green Left. Okay. But basically, their electorate is the rich. Oh, geez. And they pander to the rich a lot. <laughs> so uh, those people I sometimes you know have a little something about you know people discussing Marx as they walk past the homeless person and don't don't give the homeless person anything <laughs> that's stuff like that right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually like yeah no that's really good uh, a commentary like on there is a, a type of left right that just like it's very academic it's very theoretic it's it's not very based in reality and like they spend a lot of time discussing in coffee shops or what have you. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I can deal with those people because I, I like a good debate. And sure. I read, I read, I read das, the Das Kapital when I was 11. Okay. I mean, civics teacher was, 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 was asking me if, if, if that book I was reading was going to teach me more than, uh, than his class. And <laughs> 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 top marks. <laughs> Let's shut him up. But yeah. Uh, but, it's, it's worse than that. Um, I can't really judge the US because I only get US, Canada, everything across the pond. It really only comes to me with this microscope on issues and things going wrong. So, you know, the right. day to day sort of passes me by. But the left here in the Netherlands is basically the accepted middle position if you want to be the acceptable person in the mainstream right if you want to if you want people to listen to you then you have to be in the middle <laughs> you have to sort of post yourself in the middle or but there's there's a lot of topics where there's a lot of performative oh. you know yes of course we're on board with this and yes of course we're the good people uh we are the we are the correct people we are right about these things we we take the right positions at the same time these people tend to sort of maneuver parts of the left and some of the left parties more towards being 
unwilling allies of the extreme right than really allies. Ah. Um, Interesting. There's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes on when the mask comes off. You know, like the like uh, uh, uncle of an ex of mine, for example, lived in a huge house in Amsterdam. For those who know, uh, near the Apollo Tower, where all the the, foot, the football stars is, uh, and the bankers okay. have their houses, and uh, he bought it from the last surviving member of a Jewish family that had been deported, and he bought it for a ridiculously low amount. Right. Uh, and and he bragged about that, <laughs> being you know savvy businessman, <laughs> blah, blah blah, and he had a big house and blah, and. and doesn't seem problematic at all. <laughs> and he was a nice, proper stand-up Labour Party member, you know, and oh, involved yeah. in all the... So, and then, uh, of course, we have the tankies, and then we have, like, the, the Socialist Party that's basically always been known as open secret that the Socialist Party is fucking, fucking racist. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, so... The left in Europe, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of messed up too, yeah. So I, I I don't even really want to identify with the left. I'm just someone who's on board with not pre- treating people like shit, and um, I'm an anarchist. That's who I am. <laughs> fair, no, that's fair. I uh, oh, it's it's been a while now, but I had a friend uh, on the show from France, mm-hmm. and uh, she was talking about how like a lot of French. Like even anarchist organized groups, uh, they're really ableist still. <laughs> like she's yeah. disabled, and like there's still a lot of blind spots even in like so-called progressive movements, even in like, in Europe and whatnot. Yeah, there's, uh, but that that's that's not just Europe, of course. But right, um, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. T- talking to people from the U.S. Um, to a lesser degree, Canada. To a slightly even lesser degree, Australia and the other Anglo-Saxon former colonies. Um, it sometimes feels like we're back in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of what I see coming from the left, especially the US, really, really is like, folks, the left here, we've moved on. You know, <laughs> we've discussed these topics. We appreciate Marx. We appreciate Bakunin. We don't need to stand on those books like they're a podium. Right. They're thinkers. They're supposed to be built upon and exactly. to move on. <laughs> move <Yeah>. on. <laughs> and and at, at the same time, you get a lot of all, also all, all that performative stuff. Like uh, yesterday on Twitter, someone was going on in a long Twitter thread about every time she went to uh, Europe, she noticed how the... Uh, how we, we in Europe don't understand anything about racism. And all our examples were like typical US examples. <laughs> right. Like, for example, hairstyles and white people with dreads. We know that white people with dreads are probably going to need a little bit of a little extra hand holding to get where they need to go. go sure. be. I mean, <laughs> they probably have a rich partner and own a bicycle repair shop in a hip part of town. I mean, we understand that part. <laughs> but the whole black hair issue isn't the issue here. Right. I haven't worked I have worked in very, very corporate environments. Black people can have their hair in black hairstyles. Okay. Interesting. Um it's it's the, the whole black hair issue isn't hasn't completely gone away and racism is very pervasive, pervasive and very pernicious in Europe, but it doesn't express itself in the exact same way. Yeah, because black people didn't come to Europe in the same way they came to the Americas. Right. Yeah. Racism doesn't express itself in the same way in the Caribbean where I'm from. Right. You know, it, it, there's there's differences in how it expresses itself. Outward. The, the basics are the same. Racism, how racism came about and how it spread in society, where the ideas come from, that's the same worldwide because that's just something that happened in Europe. <laughs> and Europe exported it everywhere. <laughs> you know? But yeah. it's not that Europeans don't understand racism. It's that Europeans have a very different focus mm-hmm. because the issues play out differently here. We're fighting against blackface in, black, in, in Zwarte Piet. Right, right. 
you know, while blackface in the US, of course, is completely, totally non-acceptable already. Yeah. At the same time, if you want to have a big fro, you're fine. It, wear a suit. <laughs> right. <laughs> Put on a tie, have a big fro. No one minds. Interesting. Is that that's the difference? Um, of course, me being white presenting, I'm exaggerating. So mm. a, any person of color in the Netherlands right now who says, "Oh, but I have been criticized," I know, I'm exaggerating. It's just not not the same way, like in the United States, where when you have white people with threats, they're actually literally stealing something that's intrinsic to black culture. Yeah, yeah. Because black people came here in a different way. <laughs> Yep, for sure. Yeah, I, I my my partner is from Africa in Burundi, actually, mm. and so she talks about like the way that racism manifests there, and it's often in like uh, I'm not in, it's in ways like uh, like sort of like you would find in North America, where like uh, uh, if you dress in ways that uh, are often looked down on by North Americans, then your fellow Burundians will judge you for that. Like mm -hmm. it's often like a, 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 an adoption of the, the, uh, the, the same stereotypes and same uh, judgments, but it's very interesting. Like the way that it manifests differently in different places. Yeah. It's not that it's not there because the black hairstyle issue has been a big issue here. Only it was a few decades ago and we've mostly moved beyond it. Right. Not completely. But it's not as big an issue. So if you're walking around with threats here in the Netherlands, we just think you're a hipster and you think you're an idiot. <laughs> it doesn't have the same racial charge. And she kept going on and on and on about that. And I was like, do you even see how white US centric you're being? Right. Yeah. You well, are Americans are very US centric. <laughs> they, they can't seem to get past that. I mean, I'm white presenting. I'm very aware that on some topics, I should put in caveat after caveat simply because I do not want to be that white face lecturing other people about stuff. Right, right. I'm from a black family, living in a white society. I've lived in the black society. So I am closer to the fire than most white people, but I'm still a white guy. Right. As far as society is concerned. Right. I mean, I person personally identify as black because I'm from a black culture and a black family. Right. Okay. But I'm this kind of black person that gets told, but you're one of us because you look like one of us. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, you know, I have a lot more privilege in that regard. Um, so that, 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 that taints my perception. So I don't want to be the white face lecturing black people. Okay. But a uh, white face from the United States lecturing Europeans about how stupid racist everybody is in Europe and everybody is decades behind the United States and stuff like Eh, wait. <laughs> Our cops are bad, but they don't lynch people. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. All cops are bad, but yeah, the ones in America have a particular brutality towards uh, black folks. Exactly. I mean, I'm firmly in the in, in, in the all co cops are bastards camp, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we have to deal with things in a different way. We can't import United States attitudes to Europe and expect – to win the fight mm -hmm. because people will just basically point at us like you're, you're being silly. What you're, right. you're going on about doesn't happen. No, because racism in the workplace doesn't express itself the way it does in, you know, it, it does happen because I, I've been at a job interview once where the guy said, well, thank God you responded because the other applicant was a word. Oh, geez. So it definitely happens. Racism yeah. is very pernicious and very persuasive in Europe, but we're not, decades behind the United States, we're just fighting a different type of fight. Right, right. <laughs> and yeah. and and then you know and that's that's my issue everywhere with, with, with the left. They're so divorced from the reality on the ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. United States particularly bad in my opinion. I, I really blame the school <laughs> system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But or overall, lack of school system. <laughs> o o overall, in Europe, of course, if in, if in Europe you you join, uh, I've been part of the Socialist Party. I've been part of the um, Trotskyist Party. Okay. You'll be in the in the in the middle of uh, white faces right. with college degrees or still getting one for well, ten I'm, years. I know uh, the complaint has been made about like uh, the DSA in in the US as well, uh, like. If you go there, it's 
generally uh, people of a certain class and and like they it's generally white like it's it's a very common criticism of of leftist movements that it's a little too white and i don't have an issue with white people using their privilege to make things better sure what i have an issue with is that once they've decided they're on the right side of history then that's where they have to stop learning <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you still I'm have to good keep ones learning. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm one of the good ones now. I don't have to do any more work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's basically everything that you can find in my <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, that's great. Yeah, it's pretty uh, – that's uh, valuable social commentary uh, of the <laughs> left. That, frankly like if you see social commentary of the left from like other like from right-wing cartoonists it's all just nonsense like it's made up stuff that nobody actually but does or believes yeah or 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 even better when when they present some uh present some kind of scenario that's like utopia as if it's scary <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah. yeah that's right this is what the left wants so yeah please <laughs> legalized weed you're allowed to do whatever you want. <laughs> Everybody's lounging on their couches for the, for an hour or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, this is it. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> I could go on and on about cultural differences, but I'm, I'm just reminded about how uh, all the time people from the U.S. remind me how hard they work and the work ethic. And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a bragging point actually <laughs> i work 32 hours a week and i live just as well as you yeah that's right uh, you know okay I don't, I don't have swimming pool okay well when we were planning this you mentioned that you have a nap regularly and yeah. i was like that's amazing i i would love to have naps every day <laughs> or even just twice a week maybe <laughs> it's amazing it's, it's, stuff it's basically just part of my routine. I mean, it, it's not... It, well, 40 hours work weeks are still the norm here. Mm -hmm. um, but because we're a lot less worried about a lot of peripheral things like healthcare and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. My, my girlfriend's on disability, which is fairly decent, 75% of minimum wage. Okay. And um, I started out with the job I do now slightly over minimum wage but i've had like four races past year so i'm, well, I'm yeah so I'm, I'm i'm not on the median yet but i'm getting there oh, 32 that's... hours so that gives me three day weekend yeah and that's awesome <laughs> the rest of the time i gain by not watching tv ah well, there you go. <laughs> That's the trick, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I haven't had I haven't had a TV in my home for about twenty years now. Is that right? Yeah, it, wow. it's just one day I came home. Uh, I was at the tail end of uh, finishing up the whole mess that you get when uh, when a relationship breaks up, you know. So I didn't have a lot of furniture yet and stuff like that. And I realized that all I did when I got home was roll a joint get high, and watch cop propaganda. Oh, yeah. Well, that's no good. <laughs> you know? <laughs> there was this, this scene in, in this, this completely stupid series, Numbers, I think it was, where, the, where, the, where this FBI guy was explaining that not all of them were bad guys. And then it's like, okay, so I'm sitting here. I'm only <laughs> enjoying this because I'm high. This is cop propaganda the next show is going to be cop propaganda the show after that yeah. is going to be something stupid with cats <laughs> this is a waste of my time yeah so I, I quit two things at the same time i quit smoking weed and i quit watching tv oh yeah 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 cold turkey from one day to the next yeah well uh, that's that is something that i uh i don't watch as much tv as i used to like i used to be really like I would wake up every morning and I would pirate every show that was on that night before. And I would, I used to burn them to CDs or DVDs <laughs> so I could watch them on the DVD player upstairs. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I only watch very select things now. Like if it's, and if only if it fits my mood. Yeah. I, I, I put on a lot of uh, uh, YouTube. Oh yeah. There's, yeah. there's a lot of YouTubers that I, that I enjoy watching. 
you know, like the, the cynical historian is a great, uh, great historian with great stuff. If you're into Ooh. that sort of thing, uh, the one janitor is always insightful. So while I'm drawing, I usually have something like, uh, uh, fact fiend on. Okay, cool. Just so that there's some, some voice in my ears going on about movie trivia or something like that. Sure. Yeah. 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 That's kind of how I am with podcasts. Like I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and spend all my time doing that when I'm busy with other things that I don't have to, so that if I'm doing something physical, then I can listen to a podcast and, and whatnot. Yeah. I, I enjoy being educated and, and I enjoy sharing knowledge also a little. Um, I mean, as much as my knowledge counts these days, because it's been about 30 years since I've been to college, <laughs> but you know, um, and I think that's also a lot more important than, than a lot of the performative, uh, protest stuff. Yeah. It's, if we're going to be anarchists and we're going to be working towards an anarchist society, which I don't think is going to happen in our lifetimes, but we have to lay the foundations. Yeah. Um, then what what do we do after we have, after we're there? Right, sit around with the exact same structures that are still the same structures based on the Roman Empire that we've slapped some democracy on in the last few hundred years, <laughs> and do things the same old way because we don't know anything different. Right. So I enjoy a lot of the uh, I, I enjoy stuff like city steading. That's uh, uh, people who teach people how to make food, how to preserve food, how to brew beer. Yeah, that's it's very cool. The sort of stuff that you can do within a smaller community uh, to be a community. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. That's a lot better than cop shows, anyway. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you also uh, you you do uh, YouTube. What do you do on YouTube? I make Minecraft videos building historical buildings and explaining why the buildings were the way they were. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. How does how do you okay, I'm I, I have no idea how Minecraft works. <laughs> 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 but I know I know my kids liked it mm -hmm. <laughs> for a while. And they were always really amazed by the things that people could build. Like how does that even work? Like, do you have tools and blocks and whatever like yeah. how does that it's it basically like legos you have oh. blocks so you can build stuff with uh with the added game element of that uh when you craft a pickaxe you can get better blocks from the ground and you have to dig them out of the ground to get the blocks oh okay interesting so you know you dig you, you find metal then Metal is useless because it's ore. You have to smelt it. Then you have iron. Then you make a pickaxe. <laughs> With a pickaxe, you can mine better ores, make better tools, mine faster. Okay. When you punch a tree, you get wood. When you dig in the ground, you get dirt. When you dig deeper in the ground, you get stone. And from that sort of and on and on and on. And, and then you have blocks. And what can you do with blocks? You can build stuff. <laughs> yeah. Cool. It's, it's a fairly basic, basic game. What, what are some of the things that you've built? What are some of the things I've built? Uh, I've done um, I've done a video on uh, Muiden Castle, which is a which is a castle here in the Netherlands that's been in continuous use for a long time, but it has also been ruined for a long time. So that's big, okay. that makes it an interesting building in all the different layers and different phases in the building. Cool. Because uh, um, I've done a few semi-fictional castles, usually based upon some real life example, but just to show like what were castles, what how were they set up, what was the okay. rationale behind uh, behind it, um, and well, the last one I just went up was the Scottish Brogs, basically okay. uh, like a, a extra tall semi fortified roundhouse from the Iron Age. Wow! So a bit less visually appealing, but very challenging to build in Minecraft because your walls are always one meter thick because your blocks are one by one meter. <laughs> Oh, okay. So that makes it really tricky to put in all the details you want to show. Right, geez. It's got to, I suppose, does it have to get extra, extra big that way then? I had to scale this one up, yes. <laughs> yeah, to show how they used hollow walls to make the walls stronger and lighter so they could build up higher. Ah. Which, wow. of course, in itself is very interesting because at the time, of course, the Scottish people were thought of as barbarians and right. we've basically taken over that attitude because we're 
basically still trying to be Romans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Says I with the Roman <laughs> world map behind me. Um, but they actually had, had some pretty ingenious building techniques that, you know, rifled the way, for example, the pyramids were constructed. And we're basically, we walk past them uh, to go look at the Roman mosaics because they're pretty. Right on. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, that's cool stuff. Like I, I, I like I say, I don't know much about Minecraft, but uh, I do think uh, historic buildings are very cool, and I just I find it interesting. Do you have like a blueprint that you kind of follow, and then but transfer it into the game? I usually go by archaeological digs. Okay. And then, uh, uh, or by existing buildings. So then, of course, you you do f- sort of follow the floor plan. So it must take a bit of research and and like like reading to figure out what's going on. And, yeah. And yeah. Especially since archaeologists uh, don't uh, draw their floor plans with Minecraft in mind. <laughs> I and, suppose not. <laughs> yeah. Especially earlier archaeologists also were pretty sloppy with things like, sorry, measurements and all that sort of stuff. Oh, so, yeah. you know, and there's never enough resources and never enough time to examine everything. So a lot of buildings have last been looked at in the 1800s sometime by an antiquarian who made some sketches, you know? Right. So. Jeez. Ah, that sounds really interesting. Like quite the quite the project. <laughs> uh, yeah, I enjoy it. Like I said, I have a three-day weekend and uh, work is busy but not extremely demanding. It's basically just talking to people every day <laughs> like you. Work from home, so I have no, you know, uh, commute. Fantastic. It's basically, I think, what everybody should have. That's just part of my life. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Work that isn't too demanding, but keeps you busy. <laughs> you know, yeah. keeps do you enough to participate in society and don't work yourself to death because someone above you wants a swimming pool. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not against swimming pools. Let's let's build one for the entire community. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think the stupidest thing about how we arrange these societies is that we basically ship everybody from point A to point B every day and back to do work with someone looking over their shoulder. Yeah. While if we built the houses a bit bigger so that everybody could have an office uh, at home, Right, everybody yeah. could work at home, uh, be there when their neighbors need a little help with something, uh, be there for their children, not pollute the entire planet just to move a lot of iron from yeah. point A to point B with you in it. Yeah, for sure. And we kind of got a taste of that a little bit during the the lockdowns in various places, like where uh, people could actually work from home, but I guess. There wasn't enough control, so they had to go back to the old way of doing things. Well, actually, around here, things are slowly going back to the old ways, but we'll never be back to normal. Um, Too many people realized that they can work from home. Uh, I work at the call center. I do tech support. Okay. And uh, we closed the entire office building. Not a few floors. We closed the entire building. Wow. Just everybody works from home now. <laughs> everybody. I, I mean, when I'm at work, because I'm a little bit higher up in the sense that I, I coach people in uh, conversation techniques and stuff like that now. Okay. That's, that's part of how my salary got raised. Um, because I've, I've, I've done this before during college and all that. So, you know, I, I went back to something I already knew. And um, sometimes there's just five people in the entire floor. Oh, and it works just fine. <laughs> if if yeah. someone's if 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 someone is 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 closing calls or doing all the other tricks to, you know, appear working but isn't working, we notice. <laughs> we don't have to have someone physically there to notice that their work is excellent or their work is not excellent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my partner works uh, for a call. Uh, center kind of job as well but she works out of the home uh, and is one of like only two french speaking uh <laughs> call call center people so mm-hmm. she is she's the person who deals with french calls and if there's not french calls then she doesn't have much to do <laughs> so it's pretty good 
Yeah, well, but, you know, being available is also work. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like she can get up and just do whatever exactly. she wants. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, 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 still, I still take calls one week. Okay. And it's work. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter if you have someone on the phone or not. It's work. You're being <laughs> yeah. available. You're awake. You're being alert. You're keeping up with, you know, outages and whether, if, if uh, whatever is going on in the network and whatever is, you know, so it's still work. Yeah, for sure. And that's, I think that's one thing that we, we do have a better grasp on in Europe. Still not good enough, but <laughs> when I hear the pendejos in the, across the pond go on and on and on about work ethic, I think like, <laughs> Work yourself to death is not an eth not an ethic. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I often like. Uh, I guess we got the history here of like uh, the Protestants that came in, and they it was part of their religious culture to like be like, uh, "Work yourself until you die." <laughs> like, yeah. And so uh, I, that's kind of been passed down. Like my gener like my dad had that, and still has that. And I adopted some of that as I was learning and growing. So I still sometimes feel like if I'm not being productive, if I'm not working, if I'm not doing enough, then I'm uh, then I'm a failure in some way. It's it's really messed up. Actually, <laughs> it's there's, really there's, messed up. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's, there's a really good example that exemplifies it. I think when you want um, uh, when you when you want to take your vacation days, you What's have to convince your boss. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I cannot recall the last time I took a vacation. Well, although okay. to be fair, my my uh, my job is seven days on, seven days off. So I work a week, and then I have a week to do whatever I want. So I have an <laughs> <Yeah>. advantage. There. <laughs> You're a bad victim for my analogy. <laughs> no, it, it, the whole thing is um, when I speak to friends from uh, the Americas. Uh, they have to convince their boss yeah. that they have two weeks a year vacation time and that they, they should be allowed to take those days. Even though it's like law, right? <laughs> yeah. Me, as a coach, my boss tells me, look, you're a, you, have, you have a coaching session with so-and-so, huh? yeah? Okay, remind him he has vacation days. Oh. He has to take his vacation days. We don't want him overworked and dropping out we need right. him healthy and fit <laughs> that's a complete it's still because the company wants to exploit him for his labor right but, it but is at a, least a cultural the company difference. realizes that you know a happy healthy a fit employee <laughs> is better <laughs> to exploit yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. for sure yeah retain um, employee retention actually increases productivity. What, like <laughs> this is a thing that many companies don't seem to grasp. Uh, the simple, the simple fact that um, happy employees are more productive. Yeah, it's it's, it's as simple as that. <laughs> so like uh, the the, the right always asks these stupid questions. Like, what are you going to do when there's no one telling you what to do? I said, well. The stuff that needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, I'm still going to clean up after myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do you leave garbage piling up in your house? Yeah, that's right. Someone needs a house. Someone needs to build the house. So well, how do the Amish do it? Yeah, that's right. They get right. together, they build a house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nobody's nobody's forcing them to do, do that together, but they're doing it anyway. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, that's it, it, in, in my opinion the best way to prepare the the world for eventual anarchist society is to get these ideas out there to work on people's mindsets to share um, knowledge that you can do things for yourself you don't need to buy prepackaged food you can make your own food it doesn't take longer right it's tastier yeah um, growing your own food is gardening it's not agriculture. That's the sort of nonsense that, you know, those totally divorced from reality uh, salon socialists like to push, like fruit trees for the homeless. It's like, that's going to be a lot of rotting fruit on the, on the sidewalk. The homeless <laughs> don't need a fruit tree. The homeless need a home. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Where but, they can make their own food if they want. <laughs> ex exactly. But to a certain degree, we do need to... Uh, 
take the power back from the corporations. Yeah. yeah. So we need to become independent from prepackaged foods. We need to become independent from, well, ex- use open source software, learn how to code. Whatever you can that makes you a little bit more independent from a big corporation who otherwise would have to sell you something. Hmm. I think that's a lot more valuable than all this shouting and rah, 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 and uh, put a red flag in my profile picture and uh, <laughs> look at me being a really performative good guy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, you know, for example, I, I really appreciate someone like the punk rock farmer, even though he is a neocon. Mm-hmm. Uh, politically, we probably would have a long, healthy debate. <laughs> but he is farming. He right. is teaching disadvantaged kids how to farm he is hiring disadvantaged kids in all those roles he's farming bringing food to disadvantaged communities and i think sometimes i'm a little bit embarrassed that people who aren't even anarchists do better anarchy than we do (laughs) yeah no i feel that way too (laughs) and and often like i uh i feel that way about myself right (laughs) Like, I'm not just blaming other yeah. anarchists. Like, I'm, like, looking in the mirror going, dude, <laughs> you can do better than this. Well, uh, as long as you keep feeling that way, that means that you're still improving. Yeah, yeah. That's but true. we all live in a society. We all have to, you know, give on to Caesar. True. But, you know, I I, I kind of stepped back from the whole activism thing because there was just too many people who were really good at uh Singing the punk song about this issue, but not living the issue. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, I guess with that, uh, we should we could go into our uh, our segments if you want. Of course. Uh, so we've got uh, for counter propaganda, uh, uh, which is when we talk about uh, a subject that people have been misinformed on, or that uh, mm-hmm. the common narrative is is uh, incorrect. <laughs> uh, so you have, uh, from ag to third world issues, the left is increasingly misinformed about any topic that got into the clutches of commercial donation mills like Greenpeace at Al. So, yeah, yeah like, uh, what are some things that, uh, maybe if we want to get into specifics, like what, what is something that uh, Greenpeace is saying that is not correct. <laughs> Green, Greenpeace is basically exploiting the third world for your donations. Yeah. Greenpeace is a, a, an organization that has, since the 70s, maybe, maybe the mid-80s, not done anything useful for the planet. Some performative actions, you know, just string up a, a banner somewhere. Great. <laughs> I mean, right. Just stop oil here in the Netherlands is doing more than Greenpeace did in t- in ten years, and they've they, they've done it in a week by gluing themselves to some paintings. I mean, right? So, um, but they they go into poor communities in poor countries to fight against genetic modified uh, food, which would help these uh, farmers use less pesticides. Right, pesticides that are literally killing farmers. And uh, they're basically doing the work for Syngenta, uh, selling pesticides because everybody is afraid of Monsanto. Right. Yeah. So they're and, trading one thing, one company for another, yeah. basically. Yeah. And, and 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 I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Monsanto, but if I if you make me choose between <laughs> a genetically modified plant that actually doesn't need more pesticides, that has a bigger yield, or that is drought resistant, um. Would I prefer it if local communities did their own thing? Yes, because I'm from one of those poor countries and poor communities, and I know what it feels like when white people come over and tell you how to do your thing. But <laughs> that's exactly what Greenpeace is also doing. Right. And and while doing it, they're destroying lives just to sell you a few postcards and get, get your money. So, you know, <laughs> organizations like Greenpeace should just die. Right. Just I, uh... go away. I think of uh, like I, I keep referencing my partner, but because she talks about a lot of this stuff, <laughs> like mm-hmm. uh, being from Burundi, like NGOs spend a lot of time and money having people in Burundi talking about how much they're doing for Burundi, but never really doing anything. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> so they've got all these people from Belgium and other uh, European countries <laughs> sitting in their nice fancy houses going to president going to supper with the president and and just talking about how much the country would fall apart without them but the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> while leeching off the country uh, yeah. it's just an, it's just another colonialist way of exploiting right um i absolutely detest most ngos and um the only one that i don't really detest is one that i've worked for briefly that's plan Foster okay. parents plan, originally, but they at least they empower the local communities. Hmm. They're still not ideal, right? I mean, I was only there to help them with their website for for a while. Okay, <laughs> um, but before I slowed down my career back to something that I find manageable, I um, I was this high flying uh, accessibility usability guy in the online marketing sphere, but. Um, um, Overall, yeah, no. <laughs> they don't do <laughs> anything it's, helpful. Uh, yeah. and, and and let's and let's be let's be clear, the locals are working on solutions. Right. African universities are developing uh, GM crops. We need to get out of their business. <laughs> we need yeah. basically corporations like Greenpeace to stop spreading western propaganda and fear that's right. killing people in poor countries we need to get out of their faces out of their business and let them do their thing if they need knowledge from a university in the west open the door tell yeah. them to take what they want don't go yeah. there and tell them what they need yep yeah helping is help is giving people what they ask for not telling them what you <laughs> what they require exactly drive up a van with food you need food, take food. Yeah. Okay, food is not what you needed. What else? What what do you need? What can we give you? Yeah. yeah. What do you need? So it's it's like they're going like, look, um, West, you've lit my house on fire. Remember <laughs> in the sixties when you're fighting the communists? Yeah. Uh by the way, uh, Russia, <laughs> you lit the neighbor's house on fire. So, you know, when you were <laughs> communist, you were in on it. Uh, anyway, yeah. house is yeah. fire. So um okay, thanks for the tractor, but my house is on fire. <laughs> right yeah that's, right. that's what we're doing we're sending them tractors which 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 are alone which they have right. to buy in the west which yeah. rust and fall apart because they don't need them yeah 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 with the what is it the imf and the uh the loans to all the various countries that We'll never be paid back because that's how the system is designed. <laughs> I, I don't remember who said it, so maybe now I'm quoting someone who's really bad. But uh, uh, someone once said that uh, IMF is best called the International Murder uh, Fund. <laughs> because whenever <laughs> right. they showed up, babies start dying. Mm. I mean, the IMF is doing some good work in the West, working sure. within the system and being part of the system, which is a bad system. But they're, they're doing some reasonably good work within that framework. But they've really fucked over, like they uh, really developing fucked countries. us over. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm reminded of the time that that some um, well-meaning people from the Netherlands came to my island and set up this greenhouse with uh, aquaculture tomatoes. Okay, <laughs> they were going to teach the locals how to do farming. Okay, it's always a bit <laughs> ambitious going to a completely different climate with different soil conditions and yep. thinking you're going to teach the locals how to farm. But all right, they were going to teach people how to farm tomatoes on water, <laughs> aquaculture, in a greenhouse. Okay. In a greenhouse. Where the average midday temp temperature is 30, 30 centigrade and water is more expensive than gasoline. Right. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Seems a, misgui a bit misguided at the very a <laughs> on the generous side. <laughs> a little. It's like, yeah. you know, Westerners go to vacation in, go, go vacation in Africa. They see some, uh, uh, they, they see some, some, some village that needs uh, a school. And they think, you know what? <sighs> we're going to uh, empty our bank accounts. We're going to move to that country. We're going to live here. We're going to build that school. And then they, and then they find out that, well, schools need to be built to code. <laughs> and you need a visa yeah. and there's no welcome parade because Mr. Whiteface coming here to tell people how to do things the white way yeah yeah it's uh it makes me think of a guy I used to work with he was uh, a missionary uh 
and he would go to uh, he went to a, a, a few countries in Africa uh, and did missionary work. And he, he he said to me, "Well, the people there they 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 work too hard <laughs> because they don't listen to the way we want them to do things." <laughs> I'm like, "Wait a second, <laughs> maybe they know something about their own environment that you might not know." <laughs> <laughs> and they understand how things need to be done in a way that you don't understand. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, but you know, it, it's, it's, I think a lot of people in the West tend to think of racism and uh, colonialism as something that's really far in the past. Right. But um, sadly, everything is in Dutch. So it wouldn't be a lot of good for your podcast, but there's like old um, news, real videos that was shot on my island where they were basically just saying, look at how Shell is civilizing the locals, teaching them how to live in a house <laughs> oh, and how to wear a suit and giving them productive work at the refinery. Mm -hmm. the, refinery <laughs> the refinery that was bought up by Venezuela, by the way, and that oh, has been yeah. poisoning my people for decades. So, you know, that's another one. Because mm. once people become a little bit more aware of these issues, then suddenly Maduro is uh, fantastic because uh, everyone who waves a red flag in uh, in South America can't ever be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So then I have to remind, I have to remind Westerners that um, if you wave a book and you come to our shores, you're still just a white guy with a book. No matter what the book is. <laughs> no matter what the book is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, for sure. Oh, uh, well, that's, uh, uh, let's go on to Foes and Comrades. So, uh, this is where we talk about somebody who's, uh, possibly shitty and needs to be called out or some, and somebody who is, uh, great that, uh, needs some kudos. So for this, you've got uh, punk bands singing it, not living it, as you referenced before. <laughs> so, yeah. so what uh, is this? Uh, is this a, a common thing? Punk bands who are just singing about being anarchist and and not actually doing anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it's very yeah. common. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know, it's it's uh, um, but that's that's also because my standards for living it are different. I think. I think like uh, someone like uh, Justin Sullivan from New Model Army is absolutely committed to his ideals. Okay. I don't. I wouldn't believe anything else otherwise. But <laughs> he does not have the guts to kick people out of his band who are broken stairs. Ah, interesting. So when Dean goes off on a rant at someone whose mother just died of cancer about big pharma and stuff like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Dean, out of here. Right. That's not the punk way. We do not spout bigoted, hateful crap and then say, oh, but I had a bad day. It seems right. to, no, that, you know, that's yeah, that's what right wingers do, right? <laughs> it's 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 always a bad day when white males do it. Yeah, that's right. When my brother do it that does it, he gets arrested. Yeah. You know? Yep. Uh so there's, there's certain things that you cannot have tolerance for. You have to get rid of the broken stairs. And we're not getting rid of the broken stairs in uh, the left-wing communities, in uh, the, our thought leaders, which bads are. They have a podium. They spread ideas. And uh, we're just not getting rid of the broken stairs. We're not saying, you know what, Dean? You're great on the keys. You've written a lot of the songs. But you're going to sit back for 10, uh, 10 years educate yourself and then maybe you can come back at the reunion tour there you go we're not doing that and you know and i could name examples from different bands but you know i, I don't really like naming names so i just picked one to name right but, but there's other around, that's not the only one <laughs> it's everywhere it's everywhere. <laughs> okay yeah yeah it's, it's uh, and that's not because they're punk bands or because they're famous it's because we're in general not doing it in the in in the in left-wing circles yeah we're just too happy to have allies you have to be less afraid to kick a few allies out no that's fair yeah a, a little less tolerance for like uh the shitty leftists right <laughs> yeah. we have lots of shitty leftists 
how how are we going to educate people if we're dancing around the topic with them? Yeah, I heard something the other day. I was listening to a video and uh, they talk. It was about the atheist community, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, the the guest on the show said like uh, the atheist community needs to step up and and discuss morality if they want to compete with Christian morality. We have to present something. We have to show people something. And I feel the mm-hmm. same way about leftists. Like we, if we want people to buy what we're selling, we have to show them something. We have to show them that we can stand up for something truly and not just talk about it or like pretend, to, you know, that it's a thing. Because people can tell when you're being fake, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they won't buy it if you don't, if you're not being honest. Yeah. Well, you know, for example, um, I really understand, but I'm still highly critical. Of, for example, uh, Moscow Death Brigade. Okay. They're still touring. They're all about the unity and the brother and the sisterhood. Okay. I really like their music. I really like their message. They're still they're still in Russia. Ah. They haven't condemned anything. Right. They've made some you know peace without really saying it message, and I understand because they're in Russia and right. it's really yeah. dangerous. Yeah. But contrast this with uh, Mr. X, okay, who, uh, whose singer literally is in and out of jail in Belarus. Right. Where you're, you know, it's not bread and water. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, yeah. uh, what do they call it? Uh, 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 straight to Mars, basically. You, you just disappear. Yeah. Uh, they, this um, uh, messed up. Those are young women that were essentially when I when, I don't know exactly how old they are, of course, but you know, looking at them, they started like when they were like sixteen or something. They're banned. Right. They can't be more than mid twenties. That's that's an age when things are still really really scary. Yeah. You haven't developed a thick skin. You know, put me in a cell and I say, well, time for a nap. Especially in a place <laughs> like Belarus, and they actually had to move to Poland to be safe. Right. At that age, away from your family, away from everything you've ever known. Yeah, that's pretty even, intense. That's, that's, that's really, really, really intense. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, just me at that age, moving between the Caribbean and the Netherlands, I felt it. Right. And I wasn't a refugee. Yeah. So and then I, I said, like, okay, Moscow Death Brigade, you're all about the unity. You're all about the peace. <laughs> Are you going to wait until the borders close and they don't let Russians out anymore? Yeah. Or are you maybe a bit trying to walk between... Right, yeah, you walk know? a fine line or whatever, right? You can't do that. You can't walk a fine line against fascism. No. So that's the sort of criticism that we need to have towards each other. We don't have to completely cancel someone. Right. I like their music. I play their music. They're great. I think they do deserve criticism. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, criticism, like you say, like that's that's the trouble partly with the the whole cancel culture narrative that's been online for the last while is that like everybody's worried that if they're being criticized, that means they're being canceled, right? Mm-hmm. But we have to be able to take criticism too. We have, <laughs> like we're not nobody is great at everything, and I mean, we have to be able to hear it. Me, with my white face, living in a white society from a black culture, the black family. You can imagine that as a teenager trying to find somewhere that I actually belonged, I've done some stupid shit. Right. <laughs> I've tried to belong in some really bad places. I mean, I don't mean, I, I've never tried to hook up with the extreme right or fascism or anything right. like that. Yeah. But when I was 17 and I was a metalhead and the other metalheads were saying, yeah, but you're not really a foreigner, you're white. I didn't contest them. I wanted to belong. I've tried. I, I've, I've even tried libertarianism for a while because, you know, yeah. it's, it's sort of kind of made sense to me. I'm already an anarchist. This seems to be something that I can work with. Yeah. In my defense, we were sort of left aligned libertarians trying to stage a coup and take over, <laughs> <laughs> which worked, actually. Yeah, <laughs> so nice. for a while, the Libertarian Party was really on a course towards becoming actually properly anarchist. But still, right. if people dig far enough back, they'll find stuff about me. I'm a man. 
in a society that indoctrinates males yeah. in certain ways. No matter how feminist my mother was, some of that stuff I had to unlearn. Yeah. Sure. If people think this means that you're someone I don't feel safe around, I would feel sad, but I would understand. Yeah. But I'm not afraid of being canceled. Yeah. Yeah. It, honestly, people wouldn't even have to look that far back for some of the stupid shit I said and did. Like, like, I, I probably <laughs> said something stupid last year, <laughs> yesterday. It, we all live, we learn, we grow. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and we have to have room for that, but we also have to be able to take on the the uh, the criticisms and 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 with good faith, right? Yeah, like like earlier when we were talking, I, I took some pains to explain that in general some things are different here than in the United States, but that doesn't mean that they're completely not there and that right. me as a white person can't completely know do that just caveat just say you know what this is my opinion at this time at this point in time based on my knowledge right now. based on my knowledge <laughs> right now <laughs> yeah and take it on board when someone corrects you you're not going to get cancelled come on the people that are getting cancelled are people who, who, who walk free willy into a, a woman's uh uh, a dressing room and start jerking off in front of her. That's the sort right. of people that get cancelled. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> are you afraid that you people are going to find out that you did something like that? Then maybe you deserve to be cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, some of the people who have been cancelled, like I was pretty on board with it. <laughs> like, you go, okay, yeah, no, he shouldn't be in a public space anymore. He shouldn't have people listening to him anymore. But, yeah. but they are also the ones that have enough privilege and power that they take a, a little break, they go hide, <laughs> and then they come back a, a few months later and everybody's like, oh, look, he said a, a, an apology and he's happy. <laughs> Doesn't matter if he's saying the same things. It's just, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> well, I guess, uh, where can people find you and your content? Um, well, the, the comics are mostly on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, right. I think you're going to have to share the link because it's really hard. But it's uh, the Geek Life, spelled as T H T A H, <laughs> Geek Life. Sure. And uh, if you uh, search Twitter for K Zone DD, then uh, you should also find me. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, uh, most likely. Yeah, and 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 Mastodon as well on the. What's the server called? It's a bit new. Nerdculture.de Mastodon server. Very cool. Well, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Uh, thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me spend more time on this and my other project. If you want to contribute to all of that, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating and a review on the podcast app of your choice would be great. If you want to find out more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes uh, for links to all of my stuff and check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. Um, there you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, uh, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, the videos I do with my uh, friend Damien Marie at Hope, and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. Uh, you can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for listening and or watching. So, and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Go join a local org or uh, print off some posters and pamphlets and spread some propaganda.